Um, my name is Susan Waite, and my husband and I are co-owners of Earth Star Farm in Whitefish, up Montana, obviously. And uh, we are organic farmers, and we do kind of a full circle farm of we raise sheep, we grow chickens, we raise chickens for eggs, not for meat, but for eggs. This is our end product, the goal, and what I'm going to talk to you about today. Um, fun eggs, delicious eggs, healthy eggs, and this is our label. We're in a uh, one grocery store locally. We grow microgreens, we grow vegetables, we grow edible flowers, so we do a whole lot of things at the farm. We have a, a sustainable food forest, so a little bit of permaculture, lots of dogs. Mm -hmm. And what I'm going to talk to you guys about today is uh, how to get started having backyard chickens because it's so fun and it's so delicious and once you get started you'll probably be hooked. So and it's easy. It's surprisingly easy. The most difficult parts of raising chickens is probably the first few months when you get the brand new baby chicks. And I have an outline here which I'm going to read from and I was hoping to have a uh, I was hoping to have outlines for all of you to follow along with, but my printer was not cooperating. This is us for Star Farm. I'll put this, actually that's a little, there we go. And um, I have some pictures and we'll just kind of do a little run through the basics of what you do with chicks, how you integrate them to your flock, getting started with chicks, graduating to an outdoor coop, and winter care. So if everyone's Set. I'll get going. Uh, I need my glasses, so excuse me. And right off the bat, I think the, probably the most important thing is uh, people wonder where to get their chicks. And I have back here for everybody to take home, there are um, catalogs from a couple of different companies. Uh, local stores from Murdoch's, from the North Valley Ag, Mike and Liddell, Murdoch's people, they're just both terribly comfortable. Oh, thank you. Appreciate that. Um, incredibly helpful uh, with beginners. They helped me get started years ago, and not that many years ago, about six years ago, and answered a million fairly idiotic questions, and they answered them over and over and over, and they're wonderful, wonderful folks. So this is a little handout from Murdoch's about chicks, invaluable, just basic, how to handle your chicks, a little checklist. And this is a catalog from Murray McMurray, which is a really popular mail order, um, mail order um, hatchery. But this is where um, they supply many of our live, um, when you go into the ag and buy your live chicks, they will have come a day or two from Murray McMurray, or in the case of uh, North Valley Ag, they come from Privet Hatchery in New Mexico. And uh, let's see, I've got my little notes from on that. And. Uh, I have done it both ways. I have ordered from, there's a, I have one catalog from Stromberg's. They were very excited I was doing this talk and sent me 50 catalogs for everybody, except they didn't get around to mailing them until Thursday. Mm -hmm. So they're gonna arrive at my house on Monday, which isn't very helpful to anybody. But Stromberg's, there's that one catalog that I have back there that if someone wants to take, they're welcome to. Um, they are really uh, good for unusual, Chickens, like uh, black copper marins, which lay the chocolate, the deep, dark chocolate brown eggs. Um, mm. At our booth, I have a whole bunch of folders with um, showing our different colors of eggs, and you would see it in all, a lot of our chickens down there, but I'm afraid they're at our booth, not up here with us. Anyway, what do you need to get started? Um, assuming you, well, I think the pros and cons, I've done it both ways. I, I usually buy my chicks live at the Ag or Murdoch's, and I prefer that. I prefer selecting chick on my own. We have our farm at, currently we only have about 100 
hens and roosters. Um, for quite a few years, we had about 250 hens and roosters. And we've just sort of dwindled a bit this year due to natural attrition and meaning predators, old age, and accidents, <laughs> mostly predators. What is old age for a chicken? Old age for chicken, well, it varies. Um, old age to a commercial hatchery is, sadly, two years old. They dispose of all their chickens after two years and replenish. That's the life, that's the lifespan of a chicken that is grown commercially for eggs in factory farms. We, we are the old hen's home. We do not, um, we figure hens serve really hard and really long and we appreciate everything. We have a lot of gratitude for what they do for us and they can live out the rest of their life on our farm. So people will bring us their, their chickens they no longer want to have, their old hens, their sad hens, and they come to our farm and become happy hens because they get to run and play outside and scratch and be chickens for as long as they live. And that could be, I have heard, Mike at the Ag was telling me about um, a young customer of his who had his buff Orpington hen for 15 years. So they can live a really long time. She stopped laying somewhere around age six, uh, but she continued to be a broody hen for the next 10 years and was wonderful, kind of a pet hen. So they can live a really long time if conditions are good and presumably they receive love and good care. Uh, but in general, I think most people would find that six to seven years in the average situation is about a chicken lifespan, in answer to your question about how long do chickens live. Anyway, so um, before I get into that, I do want to go over some basics of, because it's at the top of my outline, and I'm sort of stuck on the top of my outline. Um, what is the equipment needed? Before you even launch into this, this lookbook, and this is fun, this is kind of, this is really awesome. You can go through here and just get absolutely lost, thinking, oh, I want one of these, and one of these, and one of these. Because one of the things that Murray McMurray does is they, as well as Stromberg, is they both specialize in heritage breeds, which, in my opinion, is really important as we have um, industrialized our farming, we have, with almost every animal, pigs, hor uh, I don't know about horses, but pigs, cows, chickens, there, there's been such a homogenization of the gene pool, and I, it's really imperative as we go forward to not lose those genetics of the heritage breeds of all of our livestock, because they add bigger, um, it's, it's just really important not to get your breeding stock too uh, narrow. And anyway, so, they, so these guys and the Stromberg people are really good with um, the heritage breeds. We made a uh, conscious choice when we started our flock seven years ago to only get heritage breeds that, were, that we chose for dual purpose meat if it was necessary, but we were, I really wanted egg, egg laying hands of ones that laid pretty eggs, <laughs> ones that had pretty feathers, and ones that were, should the need arise, would be good eaters. And um, they, the, the catalogs are really good because they tell you, they have little graphs and they tell you the pluses and minuses of each breed and you can really go through there and figure out what you really want to do. And they have ducks, and they have pheasants, and they have turkeys, and they're a wealth of information. I have noticed lately that the Murray McMurray catalog has a lot less heritage breeds than they used to back in 2011, or 2012, I have a 2012 catalog in there which has a lot more breeds. And there was a rather well-publicized outbreak of I believe it was avian flu, some kind of a disease that wiped out an enormous amount of our national breeding stock down in the south, which is I, Texas, Arkansas, 
Murray, Murray kept themselves pretty clean and didn't lose too many breeds, but a lot of a lot of the national breeding stock was wiped out in that unfortunate mm -hmm. epidemic. So it was kind of a real eye opener, and it's. It's interesting when you compare it to an old catalog, which I, I do have back there. Um, where was I? I don't remember. Um, so basically, yes, these are, the, these are the fun books. Look through them, figure out what you want. Then you will see, when you go to the store, you will find, you will hopefully find, um, a list. Here is a list from the North Valley Ag about what is coming in and when. For example, where are we now? Friday, March 2, yesterday, they got um, a small order of Bard Rock pullets and speckled Sussex pullets. They were all sold. They were gone when I went in yesterday. Um, but they still had some buff Brahmas from the week before. They have a whole bunch coming in, a more Americana pullets, brown leghorn pullets, Gold laced Wyandotte pullets, blue Australort pullets, Rhode Island reds, which is the classic old one, the Amor Americanas, the gold laced Wyandots. Wyandots are an American breed and they're beautiful. They have gold laced, they have silver laced. Mm -hmm. If you like feathers, you definitely want Wyandots because once they, as they drop their feathers, they're beautiful for jewelry. Um, Cuckoo Marin pullets, Rhode Island reds, production reds. Um, blue Australorp is a very unusual breed. They have Americanas, Olive Eggers, Blue Lion Dots, Silver Leghorns, Toulouse Geese, and a very unusual Blue Laced Red Lion Dot bullets, which are also beautiful and very unusual. So they are carrying, um, at the North Valley Ag, they're carrying a lot of unusual varieties. This is the Murdoch's incoming list, and they will they arrive, looks like they arrive pretty much every Friday. And you were asking the question about whether they um, hatch them themselves or whether they import them live. Or well, whether sometimes when you order them, they, a lot of them are dead when they get there. Right, so, so which is a plus when you go to the egg because you're only buying live ones. Exactly. So huge plus. That's, That's why they good. cost a little more. Mm -hmm. yeah. There's an attrition rate in the mailing. But it is kind of amazing when you do do this mail order, which I'll be honest, it really unnerved me, the idea of buying live animals via the mail. Um, but the people at the post office are awesome. And they'll give you a call as soon as they arrive at 5 in the morning mm -hmm. and say, hello, your, your, your chicks are here. Please come to the back door before 8 o'clock and um, pick them up. And they'll open the door for you. And it's, it, it, chickens are amazing. They actually survive this, I would imagine, fairly awful process of hatching in Missouri and being put in a box, this new little thing, and being bounced around all across the country, wherever they're going, Montana, arriving in the Whitefish Post Office and then being jounced home to the farm and then being put into a sheep tub. And they're just like, okay, well, whatever. <laughs> and <coughs> chickens do have this amazing um, biological gift is the only thing way to call it. When they hatch, they ingest the last of the yolk and it's, it's a part of them and they can live two or three days on that magical life that they came from. As long as they get some water, they are good to go and they can thrive. It's, so you, this mail order thing, it really does work. It's not as creepy as it sounds. And it's pretty fun. You can get some very unusual breeds that way. And I have done that with my black copper marins, and I'm really glad I did. I only had, I only lost about three out of 30. So that's not too bad. Um, I think with, um, but I do, I'll be honest, I prefer going to the store hand selecting each and every one I bring home. And usually I go back week after week and get 10 or 12 more, <laughs> 10 or 12 more. And then, oh, something else is coming in, ooh, 10 or 12 more. And it kind of goes on for about a month and a half or two, and then I, I realize it's time to stop because they're all gonna grow up at different rates. And each rate, you're gonna have to have them in different 
at different temperatures and in different tubs, so it gets a little unwieldy after a while. Okay, so this is a, I'm gonna pass these around because these are, this, this is the Murdoch's and I'm not gonna read out all the varieties they have, but if you can sort of read their graph and this is North Valley Egg, which, does, does anyone, everyone know where North Valley Egg is? Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, they're up on Route 2. And they, these are the ones that come from the Privet Hatchery in New Mexico, and I guess they've been dealing with um, this particular hatchery for about 30 years, so that's a very strong relationship they have. Where do they get it? Um, Privet Hatchery in Portales, New Mexico, if you know where that is. Oh, yes you do. <laughs> That's wonderful. Okay, well they're from your hometown. And uh, they are, the folks at Murdoch's are wonderful too. Laura in Columbia Falls, I am, I particularly enjoyed that the gal who runs it, I can't remember her name offhand in Kalispell, she's marvelous too. Um, and they're great sources of information. I will say Mike and Liddell probably have more information than anyone in the valley, I think, probably on on how to how to get going, and they have infinite patience for us newbies and talk us through it over and over. So um, I would definitely give them a shot before you go to the Murdoch supermarket, even though the Murdoch supermarket is a very good one. Okay, so what do we need? You you looked at your list, you've made your selection, you know you want XYZ breed, and you go there and you found your babies and you bring them home in a little cardboard box, then what? It's kind of like bringing your baby home from the hospital. Oh my gosh, you've got to change its diapers. It's slightly terrifying. But here you go. So what you need to come with is, first you start with, and you can do other ways, but if you're gonna get about 10, I would highly recommend you invest in a sheep trough. This is a four foot by two foot. Um, it doesn't really seem like two feet, apparently it is two feet tall. And this is where they will live. This is their gorgeous environment. They will need bedding. This is a small bag of white, um, white wood shavings. You don't want to use cedar savings. Cedar, there's something in the cedar wood that is toxic to chicks. Please don't ever use cedar shavings, the kind you would use for gerbils or bunnies or that sort of thing. There's a local bitterroot, bitterroot um, lumber, I guess, makes it, has, sells big bags everywhere in the area of great big bags of bitterroot um, pine shavings and that's a great thing to use. This is a small bag, it's much more easy to carry around. I'm sure it's wonderful too, and I'm sure it's um, just as good as the Bitterroot. This, however, is $12.99 for a little bag. The Bitterroot is you get a great big bag for six bucks. So that's kind of a difference. If you have a chipper, can you just chip up mm -hmm. and get high or? I, you know, that's a good question. I, could you get it that fine? I could open. I, would you like me to pop this open? It's really fine. Well, and this is it would make a mess. He tried to prevent mold spores. Right, he tried. So, so this is treated. The thing, if you were chipping it yourself, if you could heat, yeah, if you could dry it, kill dry, and get it um, sanitized, sanitized it would probably it would so not be worth it because you would if you got bark in there, you'd, you'd have a whole host of problems. It's really important with young chicks. Not so much with older chickens. Young chicks need really sanitary um, conditions uh, just because their immune systems are, ju they're just babies. They very quickly grow up to have amazing immune systems, but in these first, when we're in the controlled environment of chicks, it's better to go with something that's reasonably sterile. So otherwise, but later when they're chickens, Sure, if you're in the coop, that'd be a great way to have, to do bedding. Okay, so you put your, can everyone imagine this when I don't have it tipped over? What you do is you come back from the store, you fill your, oh, I'm really tempted. I'm gonna just do it, what the heck? Let's open this up, it's gonna be a mess. 
dump out your shavings into here. And you want to fill it to about an inch or two. So here you go. This is your this is your wonderful little home. And then I like to fix, take a box. Produce boxes are ideal. This is a produce box. It's got ventilation on top. Take this and there we go. I was going to do it with the bottom. But basically, cut, so you have ventilation on top. Cut a hole on all four sides. So they can freely get from one side to the other and have lots of air. Ventilation is really key. Um, say you've come home with 10 chicks. So this is a great little house. You put this in here. Great little house. They can go in. No one can get crowded in a corner. Chickens like to pile on each other and they really can um, smother each other. It, it, sadly, it does happen fairly often. Especially, well, it's just, yeah, it's one of the sadder things. Especially if one is weaker and <coughs> can't get out of the way. So. They have air on top. No one's going to suffocate because there's lots of air. They have doors on each side, so in, if they need to run out and get away from the others, mm -hmm. safety. And this will be protection from the heat lamp. So we're going to put it over here. Thank you so much. I'll let you put it away. OK. Then you need water and food. And here is a little bit of chick grit. So you put your chick, this is chick, oh this is the grit. So we don't need this yet. Where's the food? Oh here. Here we go. We always use organic feed. Um, in fact we use Big Sky feed for our chickens. Uh, it's made in Montana. It's no GMO, organic. It's wonderful. Um, this is an organic um, feed made by Neutrina which is a good, it's a good starter. You can get medicated feeds. We, we personally don't use medicated feeds because we're an organic farm and we don't do medications like that. Um, and because we often have other birds growing with our chicks, ducks or turkeys or geese, um, we, that they can't have medicated feeds. It is lethal for them. So, most important thing, those chicks need water, clean, fresh water every single day, cold. They don't want it warm, and they don't, which is why you have to be careful with the heat lamp. Keep this nice and cold. It comes apart, you refill it, scrub it out, soap and water, put the top on like this, flip it upside down, and there they go. They are attracted to the red, so they will, the red is a key thing, which is, Chickens are always attracted to red. Chickens are attracted to blood. It's just a built-in thing for them, which is why you have to be, which is why hen pecking happens. Once someone has an injury or a wound and blood, they will all jump on. It's not because they're inherently mean, they just are attracted to blood and the color red. These are two little baby, baby feeders. You put the food in here and the chicks reach in and peck at it. These are for when they're very young, like the first month. By the end of the first month, they will have graduated probably out of this size, and certainly this size, if you have 10 chicks, and they'll probably be into this size. They grow very fast. And the last, or the two last important things are the heat. And there's three parts of this. 
the thermometer. Hugely important. You need to, what I do is I rig this up. There's a hook on the thermometer and I take an old wire coat hanger and hook it over the side so it hangs right about, gosh, I wish you guys could see more. It'll come up one year. Can you, okay. So I, I hang it right here where it's sort of down where their little bodies are. And then you hang the, this is an infrared bulb. You can get them with white bulbs, but the red bulb is better for the chicks because it allows them to have a, um, they still get a, a, the diurnal cycle. They, they get the day and night, whereas with a white bulb, they think it's daytime all the time. And it's really important for their development to have a natural sleep cycle. So they will go with the um, program. This, this is a guard, it's, it's stuck in here, it needs to be cut away. I'm not going to do that because I'm returning this to, to Murdoch's when we're done. Um, the guard comes around, you put the bulb in, this guard protects it from, if it falls or slips and hits the sawdust, but you don't have a fire. Be careful with these because these do start fires. Um, this one is designed to clip clip on here and then you aim it down like a photographer's light and that works um, I still get really fire conscious so at our farm when we have our tubs out and we usually have them on tables so it's easier for us to work on you could have them on the ground um, but I would get them if you're in a garage if you're in a cold place get them lifted off the ground because it will be very cold for them so put six by six pieces of lumber to really, really lift them up so there's air circulating and they aren't too, um, well, you just want to keep them warm because chicks, when, they, when you first get them that first week of life, they have to be at 95 degrees. <coughs> That's hot. The second week of life, they go down to 90. Third week of life, they go down to 85. Fourth week, 80. Fifth week, they're at 75. Sixth week, Week six, they're at 70 degrees. And this is really important that you sort of stay with that program. There can be a little variation, but this, assuming you're keeping these, I'm gonna assume you're in your garage because that's not freezing, but it's probably not heated. So it'll be this time of year, oh, let's just say 40 degrees. This heat lamp will be all they, this, this is their key to survival. I usually put, when I hook this into the wall, I usually, uh, if I'm near a wall on a table, I'll hook it to a, something that holds a hanging plant. Something that will hold it up so the cord doesn't touch this, which gets hot. Cord doesn't, there's just no danger. Better yet, I hang these by the hanging cord so they're more like this from the, so they're hanging by a chain above and then you raise or lower the chain as the requirements heat requirements change each week you just raise it and lower it or even if, if they change during a day if, if you notice that the temperature falling off well then you lower the heat lamp if it's if they're getting too hot you just lift it a few notches the chain so just imagine a an, an arm that comes out and holds the chain holds this and then they go to the plug would you want to reduce the uh, garage space to that's a good idea yeah if you could control it if you have we usually we found that it works best first we did it in our basement and I'll recommend against that for one reason <laughs> because your entire it's a it's adorable going to sleep to little tweeting birds but um, it fills your whole house with chicken dust it's kind of amazing there it's weird but it does so we we take ours down to the barn and we have a tack room that's walled off. Our barn is not heated, but the tack room has a, what are they called, squirrel boxes on the wall. So we can control the environment there. I usually set it to about 60 degrees, not too hot. And then we use this auxiliary heat lamp. And so when I have, a, I have tables just lining the wall in the tack room. And these tubs are on each table with the arms coming, you know, the, the hanging basket arms and that there's just sort of and I often had I, I usually do bigger tubs so I have two heat lamps in each one with a space 
but we're going to assume this is just the one. It's important to, so your question was about the temperature of the room being, partitioning off part of the garage. Yeah, and that's a great idea. It would also keep things cleaner, might, might keep the dust from getting everywhere in your garage. Um, and you would have a better chance of, you regulate against drafts, because drafts are really, um, really rough on these. I deal with the draft problem myself by containing the environment. So here's this hanging up here, and I will put sometimes, depending on how chilly the room is, I will put, I'm sorry, I'm trying to see you back there, um, pieces of wood across the top, just lightweight plywood and screens, um, just window, old window screens, they're great. They allow lots of air circulation and I try to keep it where, um, as I can pull back, that just keeps the draft free without them getting, but still having lots of air circulation. Um, one little caveat, you have your beach over here with the sun lamp, you have your little house here, and somewhere you wanna have your water and your food the house is an escape from the, if the heat is too intense. You do not want the water to be under the heat lamp because the water needs to be cool. If you have it under the heat lamp, the heat will allow the bacteria to grow and then you're getting into problems. You could be super diligent and change the water two or three times a day, scrub it out every time, but that's really diligent. Um, by about the third or fourth week, you get really tired of that diligence. Um, but you could do it that way. Or better yet, just keep the water away from being directly too near the heat lamp. So they have a very warm space to gather when they want the heat. They have a space to retreat to when they are ready for a break from the heat or they're getting overheated. Okay, so these are, and these are some other little things I found. This looks interesting. I've never tried it. Chick Boost probiotics. We don't use. Um, medications in our feed or in our water. A lot of times you'll get, um, you put medicine basically in the water to protect young chicks. Uh, we don't do it, but a lot of people recommend it. Um, this is a probiotic vitamin um, and electrolyte mix, which looks like it might be pretty interesting. We might try that this year. It's new to me. Do you use electrolytes when you first get them? I don't, I did once, one year. I saw no difference, and I think that year we must have had 75 or 100 chicks in various different tubs. Um, I did only because the gal said, oh, you need these. So I was like, okay, fine, we need these. Uh, I don't think we needed them. We kept things, everything clean. Um, one of the most important things, part of keeping them clean is, <laughs> this is the funny one, Hopefully that when you get your birds, the person will remind you to do this, but you have to wipe their butts every day. You have to, when you're going in and you're doing your, you know, your daily check of the chicks, because you're feeding them, you're checking their water and their feed at least two or three times a day. And the temperature, always the temperature, and adjusting your little cord up, down, up, down, making sure that everyone's um, hunky-dory. But you also have to check their butts every single day, just pick them up and they'll be hopefully clean as a whistle and you know, give them a little kiss, put them down, they can run off. On the butt? No. <laughs> no. no. Well, you could, I, anything's possible, yes. <laughs> he was wondering, well, should I repeat it? No. No, that's okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, um, I, I don't, you may. <laughs> I give him a little kiss on the head and tell them that they're loved. That's just me. Um, but sometimes they get, and this is fatal. The reason it's, it, I'm, I'm emphasizing it is because it's a little, no one knows about it um, unless you raise chickens. And it is absolutely fatal. And so many chicks die because this is overlooked. So if there's, they're having any digestive um, issues, like for example, eating too much and not drinking enough water, you can't control that with them. Well, there is a way, apparently, but um, I've never tried it. I've just had equal water and food available 
for them to freely eat. Um, you just there's they sometimes get a, a little crust buildup and it gets stuck to their feathers and it basically closes up their oviduct mm -hmm. and they cannot eliminate. They can neither uh, because everything comes out that hole, urine, feces, and the egg, they all come out of one hole. There's just one hole. So it, it's, they've got to be able to eliminate. So if it builds up and blocks them, you just, um, it's kind of crusty, it's, it's not, it's just a baby. You just pick it off, sometimes it's stuck to the feathers, you just have to be a little bit firm. Not too firm, but you don't want the little guy to bleed, but you just p take it off. Little chick's very relieved, and you go on with the day. And you give it a little kiss and send it on its way, and it's you just saved its life. Seriously, you just saved its life. Because several days of that, and they won't make it. Especially in the first critical week or two. It's I, I can't emphasize that enough. Okay, I've lost a few and and um, we often have a, a nursery school that, that uh, takes our natural earth star eggs because they're fertilized and they incubate them and it's a really fun project for the kids but for the first few years we had a great deal of lossage because they didn't understand that point. I thought they, they'd been doing it for years and I thought they knew what they about this that key step. They didn't and they were wondering like gosh you know they, they just they just keep dying every day. I just don't understand. I'm, live and learn. It's really important. And we love the nursery school does this, so it's it's all an educational process. We don't know what we don't know, so that's important. Okay, so that's that's your setup. It's as simple as that. Um, and I have an outline, which I wish I could hand out to you guys, but it it it'll be online apparently, and it'll tell you everything you need, and it's more or less um, reiterated in this great little brochure from. Neutrina, or Murdoch's. I guess it's Murdoch's. And uh, so pick up one of these. It's very simple, very good, very clear. This is when they get older. This is a waterer for when they get older. And again, I'm assuming you have a small flock of 10 because this, is, this would serve a small flock of 10. Your daily water goes in here. This is where you put your chicken feed in here, just pour it in here and it comes out through here. It's just a giant version of those same little things. This is a feeder that when they get to be two or three weeks old and they've really outgrown these little guys, they'll still be in a trough. At this point you may have graduated to a taller trough uh, because they're, they're trying to fly at three weeks. So you put the food in here and this is the little bar. You don't want to use one of these when they're really young because apparently there's some way, I've never seen it, but apparently there's some way they can get um, hurt or stuck underneath this thing when they're very young. So don't use this for newborn babies. But later on when they get older, it's fine. I actually had one that got a leg stuck in one of the other feeders. With oh dear. Holes. And it, I don't know how it did it, but it, like its toes were on top, but its little elbow thing was inside. Oh, ow. Yeah, I, I did get out, but you know, if I hadn't seen it, it would have died. Yeah, it would have. And actually, it's interesting that you bring that up because for some reason, I have never bought these to use. I, they, they, I looked at them, I just, it doesn't look like it would work very well. So that's thank you for that story. Used. That's what we've always used, and I've never had a problem. Oh, really? Like oh, okay. Because I've always used these when they're older and these for the beginning. So cause it, it looked like nothing could get caught or stuck. Yeah. But thank you for that story. So yeah, so little foot caught in this hole. Mm -hmm. Wow. How much food waste do you have in that open feeder with the chicks defecating? A, a fair amount. So every day or every time I would go in for a feed, certainly every day at least, um, if they're particularly messy, maybe more than once a day, but I just dump it out. I just sacrifice it and start fresh. I just, it's, yes, they they defecate in their food. It's just what they do. They do it in the water too. So that's why we have to keep cleaning these all the time. Use because it for something else on the farm? This? <laughs> no, 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 the, uh, the, uh, the waste of the food. The waste, oh. Well, you know what, because you're changing out the bedding, 
this stuff every, um, well, about at least every week, sometimes more often, depending on how much the, how wet it gets. You don't want this bedding to get wet. So every time it gets, and it gets wet from urine or from spilled water, and it can cause problems, cause health, health problems for the chicks. So I just throw, throw it away. I put it in the compost pile with the chips. So yes, it composts. I don't have, I haven't thought of any brilliant thing of what to do with the waste feed because it gets all mixed up with the pine chips, the shavings. Yeah, it's kind of, it's kind of negligible. Let's see. Okay, so that's the babies, and that's really all you have to do. So for the first month or so, and figure that they're going to be in these tubs for six to eight weeks until they start growing their, they get past the pin feathers and they're starting to get real feathers, then they are sturdy enough to go outside. At that point, you're down to, once they hit 70 or 65 as, as the ambient temperature in here, they're pretty much good to go. Um, outside because at that point they've got their feathers or the beginnings of their more than the beginnings of their feathers they've got feathers which will keep them warm in our climate probably if you were more southerly they could go outside sooner but we we're we have more temperature extremes so it's I'm really talking to what we're doing here <coughs> so then you get to go out to let's see is there anything I've not thought about um, Oh, pullets versus straight runs. I don't know if you're familiar, but you'll when you look at these ag lists, they'll say sometimes they'll be da 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 pullets, 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 straight run, pullets, 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 straight run. Pullets theoretically are all female, and it's not a guarantee. But theoretically, they have been sexed at the factory before they're put in their little boxes and mailed to Murdochs to get put in their tubs and out for us to buy. There are always surprises. We have lots of roosters. <laughs> uh, no matter how much, yeah, that's just, that's what happens. Um, straight runs are absolutely no sexing whatsoever. So they are theoretically 50-50. So that's where you, if you are actively looking for a rooster, and I highly suggest everyone needs at least one rooster, they are key, um, go for a straight run. You'll probably get lots of roosters. If you want to wing it, and you say you've got 10 pullets, there's also a high likelihood you will have one rooster in there. Mm. It's why, do you, why do you want roosters? Why do you want because roosters? We have, a, we have neighboring roosters that have 4 a.m. cock-a-doodle-doodle fights. Oh, dear. Yes, they across need to the valley. Oh, dear. Mm. Well, I don't know if it's cock-a-doodle fights. That's just. Well, it's their nature. That, it's call and response. It is a call and response. Yes. Okay. Well, but at 4 a.m. <laughs> yeah, I hear you. Well, we have 12 roosters. Actually, we have now 11 roosters. Uh, friend's dog took our dear old rooster a few weeks ago. Mm. Yes, I know. He was he he he's been a good boy for a long time. And he moved so, on. So why do you want roosters? Why do you want roosters? Are imperative in my in my opinion. I know that the town ordinances often say you can't have roosters within um, city limits for the very reason you're talking about the call and response. Um, we roosters have really pretty much three functions. They are the best protectors, of bar none, for your flock, your hens. Their entire job is to look out for their flock, their hens, their little harem, and keep them safe from all predators, even humans. If you, when you come in to collect eggs, they will let everyone know that, oh my gosh, that biped is here again stealing our eggs. She's a terrible predator. She comes every day and no one stops her. Um, as well as the foxes, the hawks, the eagles, the owls, dogs, anything that goes wrong in the um, chicken yard, the roosters will sound the alarm and gather all the hens to safety, usually pop them behind them. If they're outside, pop them behind them or pop them in the, um, take them into the coop, take them under trees, they will take them to safety. So that's number one. Number two, and they are really good. They're, they're just, they're amazing. They're, are, I know, 
watch how our dogs, we have a lot of dogs on the farms of all different sizes and they're all engaged with the chickens, usually on the other side of the fence. A couple of them are allowed into the chicken yard, but most of them are stay on the other side of the fence because they're, because they're healers <laughs> and they like eating chickens. Dogs are the worst predators for chickens, by the way, by far, by far. We all think it's something wild, but dogs, more than often than not, it's a dog. And I say this as someone who has seven dogs on the farm. And many visitors every day who come, our workers who come, they bring their dogs. It's a bring your dog to work kind of place. And we've had to set some pretty stiff rules because it's just the way it is. But, the, but ma mainly it's, it's safety. Predator safety and they fertilize the eggs. If you ever want to have a broody hen hatch her eggs in your backyard, which is magical, you have to have a rooster. She can't hatch unfertilized eggs. And having your own chicks hatch in your chicken coop or hen house or under a tree or under a straw bale is one of the best things ever. It's, you just can't imagine. It's so cool. And watching the whole nature cycle take its course. How would you control the, the, the fertilization versus the, uh, the non-fertilization of the eggs with that? You can't control it. Roosters. Um, did you did you read this question? Okay, he was. Thank you. I appreciate the, the prompt. Uh, he was asking how we can control the um, fertilization of eggs or the not fertilization of eggs if you have a rooster. How you can maybe keep some hens unfertilized and some fertilized. Correct. Correct. Okay. Um, and the answer is you absolutely can't. Well, I suppose you could physically separate them but that would make the hens unhappy. That would make the rooster unhappy. Um, and roosters, let's just put it this way. There are a whole lot of really common sayings in our language and in most languages and um, that are based on farmyard dynamics. And what they say about roosters, um, well, no, they are just, they're just at it all the time. That's, other than protecting the girls, they're really interested in the girls. They're going on dates all the time, <laughs> all the time. It's just in the most inopportune times and places. It's amazing. So um, I, I would wish you good luck at keeping. I don't. It would be very hard to keep them unless you. They were completely physically separated, and um, you would still get the some aspect of the protection because he would sound the alarm, and if the hen is smart enough and if she's on the other side of the fence, some separation, partition. She might go off to safety. She might not. I don't know. But we've never done that. You can eat the fertilized eggs. Oh my oh, gosh, yeah. yes. So They're, that's not an issue. Right. It's, some people actually prefer it. They think it's they, they more prefer nutritious. For fertilized eggs. Oh, yes. Yeah. Some people prefer fertilized eggs because they deem them more nutritious. And the, the question was if we can eat fertilized eggs. And the answer is absolutely yes. Um, if you were vegan, well, if you're vegan, you're not eating eggs. But I, I know when I used to be vegetarian, I had a little qualm about eating eggs, and I, I made myself feel better back in those days by saying, oh, but they're not fertilized. So, you know, it's okay. It, teenage justification for still eating eggs. Um, and these days, uh, yeah, I, absolutely. There's, there's nothing, a fertilized egg, if, under the right conditions will absolutely develop into a chick, but the right conditions entail being sat on by a broody hen for 30 days and kept warm. So our eggs, I would presume that all our eggs at Earth Star Farm are fertilized. Um, you know, these guys are all fertilized, but they're not gonna hatch into a chick because it's cold out and they instantly go cold. And when the hen gets up, walks away and there you stop the process right there, sort of natural refrigeration in the summertime, um, actual refrigeration. So it's a very good question, but um, I don't think it's a problem unless you have a, an emotional problem with it. <coughs> and there are people- You pick your eggs daily. Oh yes, yeah. uh, definitely. Sometimes twice a day in the, in the deep winter. I pick my eggs. Oh, I'm sorry, he asked if we, picked eggs daily. We collect our eggs daily and the answer is absolutely yes. And in the winter you collect your eggs daily. 
um, because they'll freeze. So twice a day when it's below zero, um, so they don't freeze in the coops. Uh, in the summertime, twice a day, oh my gosh, <laughs> the time is flying. In the summertime, um, twice a day because it's so hot. You don't want them to go back. So you don't have to, but it can get pretty hot around here in August. Yeah. Anyway, um, oh my gosh. Well, there is so much more I have to say. And oh, okay. So moving them to the outdoor coop. Oh, let me talk about two things. Um, this is important. This is assuming you move to the outdoor coop. We don't heat our coops. We have four different coops, different sizes, um, home built, except for one, uh, which was we call the Taj Mahal because it was built by the shed man and it houses about 100 hens. Uh, most of them have been thrown together with odd scraps of lumber. One is a geodesic dome that we built with um, electrical conduit and shrink wrap. And that's, that was our first chicken coop. It has lasted six Montana winters and a grizzly bear attack, and mm -hmm. it is still going strong. We stack it with straw bales in the winter to hold the heat in, and that little geodome is rocking, even though it was by far the cheapest of our coops, and it's huge, it's 25 feet across, and it's, it's marvelous. But we don't heat them because the hens keep themselves really warm, even on the sub-zero days, not a problem. Um, their feathers are amazing insulation. It's incredible. But you do need, in the winter, this is a um, heating heater, and it's very simple. This is why you need uh, some electricity out in your coop, even if you don't have heat, because you need to have, this is a heated drinker base. You put your, well, these usually come in, we use metal ones. This is a small, apparently it does work on this. It won't melt the plastic. This just warms this enough that it doesn't freeze so the girls can drink. Water is really critical to chickens and um, fresh, clean water always. Fresh air and sunshine, good, clean, nutritious food and vegetable scraps. Um, oh, gosh. <laughs> yes. For, for that heater, if someone were um, living off grid on solar, mm -hmm. uh, what's the wattage pole on the heater? Normally, heaters are pretty big drain. They are a big drain. 125 watts of power. He was asking how someone uh, off grid could um, use one of these um, if they're on solar because the heaters take a lot of electricity. So, that's a very good question. Um, I don't know if 125 watts of power. Um, is doable, I would think it would, that that would take a fair amount. I don't know what your electrical loads would be, so I can't really answer that. Probably the watts. The, oh, the, the watts. watts. Yeah, 125 watts of power. Yeah, so hopefully that means something to you. <laughs> um, how much of a fire hazard is that? Because if you're laying it down in the straw and stuff in there. Really, exactly. And that used to make me, he was asking how much of a fire hazard this heater is. Um, and that's why we don't do, fire hazard is the reason we don't heat our coops. Because uh, coop heating, that's how most, um, most coop fires are started by heaters in the winter. And I'm just very leery of that. So this is not a fire hazard. We have them in all four of our coops sitting on. I usually build a little wooden base that holds them off because the we do a deep litter straw and um, holds them up So, because they'll kick straw into the water. Here's, here's the water sitting on top. They, water gets very dirty very fast. Everything gets kicked in, the, the straw or the shavings that are in your coop. Um, and no, it's, it's, it's so low temperature. It's warm to the touch, but you can hold it. It's not going to burn you. So it's not going to ignite a fire. And there's usually enough moisture in a coop in the winter just by their breathing. Chickens give off a lot of water um, just by expiration. And so I... Do you know the cost? For the of this? Yeah. yeah. I think it's around... Oh, is it marked? I don't think it's marked. I don't see it's about... 
more or less $25, possibly 20, possibly 30, but let's just say 25. So it's fairly reasonable and, and it's really key because if a hen doesn't get enough water, it's really hard for her to lay an egg and it's very painful. I use a heated dog bowl, but it gets really dirty. Yeah, yeah. that would, but that's a good idea. But it she uses a heated dog bowl and that's another excellent alternative to this, if you, especially if you already have it. But it, was, it gets very dirty, so. Yeah, it would get very dirty, yeah. <laughs> Just don't do ducks, that, that's the <laughs> definition of dirty. Oh, my word, fun. In the summer, um, I had a whole bunch of pictures of amazing chicken coops. This is a beautiful one that is being sold at the egg. This is if you're not gonna build your own like we do. This is gorgeous. These are made by the Amish. I'm trying to get these pages separated. I'm gonna pass these around. It was taken in the snow yesterday. This is the most well-built, stunning chicken coop I have seen. It's uh, a pretty penny at $1,000, but I'll tell you, it is, if you're not building your own and doing it right, this is the way to go. The, you can get coops for around $400 um, from mail order, that sort of thing. This is more of the same Amish coop. And I think they said it was about 10 hens, 10 or 12. 10 or 12, yeah. Depending, and that's the other important thing. If you, here is a commercial coop, it's less. Here is, um, this is what I do to transition. Uh, this is, these are. Can you hold that up to me? Oh, oh, there we go. Or these are just off the internet. There are as many how to build your coop ideas on the internet as you can imagine. The most important thing you do is we do free ranging. If you free range and free pasture your chickens, they can have a much smaller coop. And then I'll just, I'll just pass these. These are tiny, they won't show up very well. Oh. I know, isn't that amazing? Yeah, that's, that's incredible. Um, if you, if your chickens can run free, you keep them, keep them fenced because grizzlies happened. Grizzlies happened on our farm when we were, when we were very poorly fenced, i.e. a home, a homegrown job. Do you do electric fencing? Uh, now we do after the grizzlies. And um, so we do electric, we have electric wire around a real fence and it has made a huge difference. We have, this protects, this is this glitter tape. This is a really good predator defense. This protects against birds of prey. You let this flutter and your hawks, eagles, owls will um, stay away for the most part. Um, these are called critter getters. Critter getters, these are an electronic, they're battery, and you mount them on the fence, and they're motion sensors, and when um, something walks by them, they emit a simply dreadful sound. Um, <laughs> it's piercing, it's dreadful, and it only goes for a short time, but enough to startle everybody in sight. And, uh, um, I, but I recommend these. After the Grizzlies, we got these before we had time for the, uh, uh, before we got the electric wire put in and it saved us for that interim where um, we were trying to get, get properly fenced. I mean, there was a period of a few months where we just, yeah, what are we gonna do? So um, critter getters, I really recommend we put them on fence posts. We still use them in the summer. Um, what else? Uh, I have one There's question. so much else. Yes. About, and this is more the feed. When do you start letting them have this grit or whatever? Oh, the grit, the chick grit. The question was, when do we start letting them have grit? And this is grit, chick grit. This is really important. This goes into their gizzard. This allows them to digest food. It, it grinds up the food in their gizzard, which is sort of in the throat area, right at the top of the chest. And that's the beginning of their digestion because they don't have teeth. Uh, you can pretty much let them start having grit um, kind of within the first few weeks. Do you put it with the food or in a different spot? I have never used this with my chicks, so this is something I haven't done, so I can't speak from experience. Um, I do know that it's a good thing to do. Uh, I would presume you might want to use 
one little feeder for grit and one little feeder for food. But I wouldn't do it in the first week or two because they might confuse the grit for food and oh. keep eating grit and not get any nutrition. So I would um, consult a book. There are a million wonderful books out there um, <coughs> and websites that will tell you so much. One book that's tiny, readily available, and that I found really useful is this one is The Hobby Farms Chickens. It's got a wealth of information. Small little book available at any ag store. Um, and I have a, as you can see, I have a whole lot of chicken books. They're a lot written. But this one I find is my go-to. I keep going back to it when I have questions. I have some very old books from the 40s that have really interesting ways of raising chickens. Mm -hmm. um, we probably wouldn't like that these days, but uh, it's good to know. Did you have a question? Oh, OK. Um, what else? Oh, there's so much else. <laughs> I'm out of time though, so this is, a, but we have a question, yes. I just had a quick question about feeds for uh, grown layers. Um, for, uh, for what? For grown laying chicks. Okay, um, what kind of feeds for, for grown laying chicks, so young hens? Yes. Okay, we, um, the, the feed that we use is we use Big Sky Organics. It's from over the other side of the divide, and it's organic, um, made in Montana, really good blend. Do you um, use any layer? Oh, we always use layer because we have, meat birds are um, encouraged to use a different feed which encourages much faster growth so they can be harvested young with big bodies. The layer feed is a much more um, conscious way of feeding your bird. It doesn't, it doesn't promote super fast growth. It allows natural growth and they'll be much healthier in the long run. They'll live a lot longer. Uh, for meat chickens, nobody's terribly concerned about how long they live. So it's a, it's a different uh, philosophy entirely. Yeah, I've, I've seen people do just layer versus a layer versus a kind of scratchy mix. Now I do a 50-50 and I've seen if it works better, but is it bad for them to have a layer and scratch mix? Oh no, oh no. The more varied their diet, the better. And that's why I really recommend free, free pasturing, free ranging your chickens because they need bugs, worms, mm -hmm. um, they even eat mice apparently. I haven't actually seen it, really? uh, yeah. But the more they can get natural and greens, they eat vegetables, we give them um, scraps from the uh, orga our organic um, Third Street Market, keeps us well filled with scraps. The juice bar in Whitefish keeps, fills up buckets with the uh, juicing debris, fantastic. The birds adore that. It's so, not citrus, right? Or does that matter? Um, they just don't eat oh, they citrus. Don't like they don't eat okay. citrus and they don't eat onions. Um, mm -hmm. They don't eat banana peels. They're not worms. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> avocados are poisonous to them. Avocados are? Okay. Well, I don't usually feed them avocados. I feed myself avocados, yeah. but yeah. Um, and that doesn't surprise that. me. I didn't know that, but I was looking online and I saw something that was like, I guess avocados, skin, pit, all that will kill them. Yeah. I, I believe that's the same for dogs. So this, we're talking about avocados being poisonous for chickens. And I know I'm about to be yanked. Okay. Yes. She needs a signature for oh, chickens. Oh, absolutely. Thank you very much.